Okay, okay, I'm all set. Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Uh, today's Friday, so it's Self-Improvement Friday. My friend John is here uh, leading the Self-Improvement Fridays. And um, I'm delighted you know, to today's subject of uh, Hero's Journey and Plato's Cave. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's really intriguing, so I'm really looking forward to that. Um, I'm going to hand it over to uh, John. I want to let you know that we have just launched a subreddit um, I'm, you know, I'm going to put the link again in this one. This is uh, Reddit allows you to continue the conversation, you know, before the meetups. And I'll be posting all the upcoming meetups there. I'll be posting all the videos there. And you can comment on whatever you learned. You can look at the past videos and comment on them. So please, uh, please join. And um, let's have a converse, continue the conversation outside of the meetups. And I think that will enrich the meetups and get more people uh, involved in it too. All right, so with that, John, take it away. Wonderful, thank you. Um, welcome everybody for coming. Welcome everybody who is new here. Welcome back for everybody who's returning. We appreciate uh, your time here. Uh, as Shrika mentioned, we are today we are analyzing um, Plato's allegory of the cave in his book, Republic, superimposed with uh, Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. So we're looking at it through that particular lens. And why I chose to do it this way, obviously everybody here has, ever had, has heard of at least one, probably both of those those concepts, Plato's Allegory of the Cave and Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey. Um, but I think it's most effectively, something can be most effectively impressed in memory when you tether it to an existing part of your own knowledge. So that way, when you tie things together, when you coalesce them together, when you imbue them together, when you look at things and how they relate to other things, I think you'll have a, a higher propensity to be able to recall that thing and apply, uh, apply it to your life and why I chose these two, because I, I think both of these things are very important for us to remember throughout our entire journey of life at any given moment. These things can always be important to us. So um, with that said, I'm going to dive into, so first of all, I've, I'm using a particular structure and methodology of Hero's Journey into 12 steps. A lot of people know it from the simplistic analysis of, of okay, there's a hero, he has a problem, he meets a guide, he crosses a threshold, he slays his metaphorical dragon, he gets the gold, he returns to his city, right? That's like six or seven steps. You can find diagrams up to like 30, 40 steps, like sub layers, sub layers. I found a particular one that I really liked that had 12. Um, in particular, I'll, I'll just read it off and then we're gonna go over into uh, the, the allegory of the cave and how they all apply. So I have first, I have stasis, then I have the call, uh, the refusal of the call, the guide, passing the threshold as number five, six is challenges, Seven is the abyss or the, the dragon, the main villain. Eight is the climax or the, the heroic surmounting. Nine is refusal of return. 10 is return. 11 is elixir. 12 is the ascent or the evolution or the integration, you can say, of these lessons. So again, it's totally fine we don't, if, we, if we don't remember those. We're going to dive into each section of Plato's Allegory of the Cave. Um, for those who don't know it, um, a, I don't know, 30 second synopsis, there are prisoners tied into a cave, they are forced to look at one wall at a time, they can't move their heads, they cannot converse, and behind them there is a fire, and they're, they're underground in a cave, behind them there's a fire, and there's people passing objects in front of this fire, so these silhouettes are cast on the wall in front of the prisoners. So if I cast a, a picture of a, I don't know, a book or something, physical object, they're going to believe, the prisoners are going to believe that shadow is reality. And they're not going to understand that there's a lot deeper implications that they just can't comprehend at the given moment. And then the thought experiment is, what if one prisoner escaped and saw the former objects as shadows, as tangible three-dimensional objects? Um, what would what would like undergo his consciousness? How would he change? And if he were to return to the cave, what would happen there with the implications in relation to his former prisoners and his own psychological state as well? So that's like a synopsis in a nutshell. And what we're going to do is those 12 points I established from Hero's Journey, I'm going to read sequentially from the allegory of the cave, and we're going to look at what section the hero or the prisoner um, is going through in these particular uh, phases. I thought it was actually very interesting that it was almost in sequential order as I was reading the allegory of the cave. It was almost as the exactly what I just gave to you, stasis, the call, refusal of the call, et cetera. Um, I think only one or two things I had to change the order of, but other than that, uh, maybe that's just a testament to, to Plato's writing, but it was very much um, lined up in, in, in the order. So the first, first section we can talk about to, to coalesce again, 
um, the hero's journey with Plato's allegory of the cave is stasis. So this is the complete comfort zone. This is complete, um, you can say, mediocrity, complete. Everything is at a standstill. And in Plato's allegory of the cave, um, this is book seven in Republic, um, I'm just going to read the section where I, where I think stasis would be. And it's obviously the introduction. So it's what I just described with the, with the prisoners. It says, behold, human beings living in an underground den, which has a mouth open toward the light and reaching all along the den. Um, here they have been since their childhood, and their legs and necks have chains so they cannot move, and they can only see straight ahead, um, and also being prevented from the chains from turning their heads. Um, above and beyond them is a fire, all that stuff I just explained. But um, they are essentially locked into their own comfort zone. They cannot move. They are just like in, in stuck in this one particular area. So this would be stasis. They're stagnant. They cannot move. They cannot perceive or experience anything different from whatever they've experienced up until that point in their life. So that is stasis. The second step in the hero's journey and the second step in allegory here would be the call to adventure, Joseph would say, Joseph Campbell would say. And this is hypothesized as a, as a thought experiment from Plato, where he says, um, and now look again and see what will naturally follow if the prisoners are released and disabused of their error. So he's just pausing it as a, thought, as a thought experiment. What if this person was released from their chains and they had free will and they can go on their own volition up the cave, they can look at the fire, they can look at these objects, they can even go further if they, if they so desired out of the cave itself and see the actual sun as the true source of light, see these, these inherent real world objects in their natural state um, to perceive truth as it is. So that would be the, the second aspect, which is the call. Um, the third is the refusal of the call. So this is an, it's a it's calling for an opportunity. You have the possibility to do something, but again, you have free will. You can let your fears take over. You can succumb to weaknesses or, or insecurities or uncertainties or doubts, and you might refuse a call. Um, and in this situation, in Plato's allegory, um, it says if he were to escape his chains and he were to face the light, um, any of them is liberated and compelled to suddenly stand up and turn his neck round and walk and look toward the light, the, the following will happen. He will suffer sharp pains, the glare will distress him, and he will be unable to see the realities of which in his former state he had seen the shadows and then conceived someone saying to him that what he saw before was an illusion, but that now when he is approaching near to being and his eye is turned toward more real existence, he has a clearer vision. What will be his reply? Uh, will he not be perplexed? So there's a lot of psychological obstacles that might take place for this hero to refuse the call. Perfectly merit, right? There's a perfect reason for him to, to, to do that, especially in the introduction when we learn that that person was chained in the cave since birth, right? So it would be one thing if it was a, a small time frame, but it was literally since birth. So they would have nothing short of an existential crisis if they were to have this old perceived world of what they believe to be reality completely shattered completely dispensed with completely jettisoned and now they're just thrown into this new world that is utterly chaotic in their own perspective so they would have the possibility to refuse a call at that point assuming they did not they would meet a guide okay and the guide i would just define this as any external force that would um it would give you the potential or it would give you affirmation of your beliefs or it would give you reassurance that you have the possibility to do this. Um, it could be in the form of usually in like narratives and mythology and, and movies. It's an external figure that has done this journey themselves. So they are already ascended. They've already done this. They say, hey, you can do this. I've done it before. It's possible. I'm going to give you some tips. I'm going to give you some pointers, whatever. Uh, in this case, there's not really an exogenous entity. It's more so I would say the guide in, in the allegory would be the actual true item. So if the prisoner saw an animal, a shadow on the wall, if they saw the real animal, that could be an exogenous or an external entity that would actually affirm the new potential of a reality, if that makes sense. So it's, they might have a hypothesis, okay, I might have been living a lie this entire time. So they're dealing with this, this cognitive dissonance. And that real item would be the guide because it's affirming that possibility of a new future or of a different reality um, that they've already experienced. So assuming they chose to follow the guide's advice and they chose to look at that as an indicator and they chose to pursue, I think the most important virtue here is courage. Obviously, it's going to be sequentially applied through every single iteration of this journey. They have courage. Um, they follow the guide. They are going to pass the threshold. 
Um, you can look at this threshold from order to chaos. You can look at this threshold from the known to the unknown. A bunch of different um, verbiage you can superimpose over this. So crossing the threshold as the fifth um, iteration in this journey in Plato's allegory it is the following. And suppose once more that this prisoner is reluctantly dragged up a steep and rugged ascent and held fast until he is forced into the presence of the sun itself. Is he not likely to be pained and irritated? When he approaches the light, his eyes will be dazzled and he will not be able to see anything at all of what are now called realities. So obviously he's completely overwhelmed. He's in peril, he's in chaos. He's in a hazardous world. He's ill-equipped, he's incompetent to deal with this world. He has no idea how to make of this or what to make of this. And I would think the inevitable successive step after that is the six, which is coming across obstacles and challenges. So these aren't necessarily as profound as the, um, as, as the final, I would say, um, abyss, which we're going to get to after six, which is seven. But I would say number six is essentially just challenges. So it's, there's, there's a myriad of one here. So we have in Plato's journey, he will require to grow accustomed to the sight of the upper world. At first, he will see shadows, and then he's going to see reflections of men. And he's going to want to gravitate towards those shadows because that's what he was recognized. That's the, that's the indoctrination he was subject to. So he's, want, he's going to familiarize himself with those first. And then he's probably going to realize, okay, those shadows are actually a illusory um, representation of the tangible object that's in, that's before me. He's probably going to recognize those next. Um, and then from the allegory, then he will gaze upon the light of the moon and the stars and the spangled heaven. And then he will see the sky and the stars by night better than the sun or light of the sun by day, certainly. And then Plato goes on this long, you know, deductive rant, classic Plato style. And he essentially says, you're going to wander or wonder about the external world. You're going to have that same compensatory reaction about your internal world as well. You're going to wonder, okay, what is my place in this entire thing? What, who am I? What, what was my conditioning that led up to my perspectives, my philosophies? What are these beliefs I've held for so long? What are these beliefs I've held my entire life? Are they even valid? Do they have merit? Have I observed them? Have I validated them? Um, so, so there's a, a bunch of introspectness going to take place from um, ex exposing yourself to the external world. And I would look at this as a challenge, absolutely. Because like I said, this individual, he has never stepped foot in this foreign um, reality before. So that would deal with a lot of psychological uh, issue, a lot of psychological, um, like just, just chaos, I would say, in short. So eventually, I would say the inevitable would be leading up to the, you can say the, the villain or the abyss, you can say, or death and rebirth. There's a lot of ways to say this. I'm just, I just like to use the word abyss. And this is encapsulated in the allegory of the cave in the following paragraph. And again, it's like a, it's a sentence after um, where he's talking about introspection about the ex external world and yourself. And Plato says, um, yes, I think the prisoner would rather suffer anything than to entertain these false notions and live in this miserable manner. Um, imagine once more, I said, such a one coming suddenly out of the sun to be replaced in his old situation. Would he not be certain to have his eyes full of darkness? So this is, again, this is the inevitable accumulation and amalgamation of all of these challenges just hitting you at once. Um, because you don't have the capacity, because it's, like I said, this individual does not have the competence. He's not equipped to deal with this psychological um, cognitive dissonance. He's not prepared to entertain any new ideas because he's never been subject. He's never been exposed to any new ideas in his entire life. From childhood, he was exposed. This is the way the world is. This is truth. This is real. This is what you can objectively prove. Okay, and everything was just dispensed with. All of that was thrown out the window. So that would be, I would say, an abyss. Um, as Plato said, he would rather suffer anything. He would rather do anything than entertain these false notions. So again, nothing short of an existential crisis in the abyss phase. The following, um, the following phase would be the refusal of, or sorry, I skipped one. Um, eight is the climax. So this is like the surmounting of these obstacles. So you can say this would just be the inevitable um, I don't know, conditioning for him to be part of his environment. And this is encapsulated in the allegory in the following. Um, Plato says the prison house is the world of sight. Uh, the light is the fire of the sun. So he's talking in metaphors, of course. Uh, you will not misapprehend me if you interpret the, this entire journey upward, this entire allegory of the cave as the ascent of the soul into the, in, into the intellectual world. Uh, in the world of knowledge, the idea of good appears last of all and is only seen with an effort 
And when seen, it is also inferred to be the universal author of all things beautiful and right. And then he goes on a whole different rant. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. He said the particular line, the idea of good appears last of all. So you can say, you can look at that in a sense of, e even in terms of this prisoner's pragmatic definition of what is real or what is accessible to him, um, it would appear last of all. So you have to go through this phase of like condensation of your beliefs and introspection and self-analysis and this chaos and this uh, reintroductory period period to what he would deem truth. And given enough time, you know, as the metaphor of his eyes eventually adjusting to the light, right? Because he was, he was bred and born in darkness. If he was eventually adjust to the light, you would say psychologically, he might adjust to his new environment as well. So I would look at that as a ultimate climax, right? He surmounted this confusion. He surmounted this chaos. He understands the world is as what it is. His senses are working and functioning properly. Um, he might be a little bit still confused, but he has the strength to understand moving forward. I might have, I, I might deal with further um, consequences and uncertainties, but I would, I just surmounted such a radical shift that I can carry that strength and that certainty and that confirmation of conquering that with me moving forward. So I would look at that as, as a climax, as a heroic journey, right? Uh, but of course, it's not over. We're only at eight. We have four more successive steps in um, the hero's journey. So next, after this climax, we have the refusal of the return. And I want to take a quick, quick um, intermission here because it's, there's a lot of implications on why we would have to return in the first place. Like, can't this hero, can't he just, um, you know, go out his, his little journey and then surmount his, his obstacles and win and then just go on his way, right? Do live in the upper world as he, as he would. Um, and Plato actually makes kind of an ethical argument of the kind of like we exist as, as one. And he goes into like a little bit of, of, of his political beliefs with like the, the um, constituents of the state you shouldn't like neglect those individuals because they are reflective of you in some sense. Um, kind of, you can make an argument of like the weakest link in the chain argument. Like we, we, as a human, we, as a society, we, as a culture, we, as a city, we, as a group or a tribe, whatever compartmentalization you want to use on this, we advance at the rate of the lowest common denominator. For example, you can say, you can make an argument like that as well. So that's the, I don't know, moral or ethical argument for the return home, if you will. So, Plato is arguing, and I would think it was also a moral obligation to somewhat, uh, moral obligation to return to this cave, right? To expose these new ideas, to expose these new beliefs um, from the constituents that shared your, your common upbringing, right? So if we, if we subscribe to that, if we, if we agree on that, um, that establishment that it is his obligation to return, he has the possibility of the refusal of the call. And again, this can be um, many, many, and this is actually one of the breakout groups we're going to get to in a few minutes here, but the refusal of the call, I think it's encapsulated in this following statement by Plato. He says, men, if, if the prisoner were to return to the cave, men would say of him that he went up and down, he came without his eyes, and that it was better to not even think of ascending. And if anyone tried to loose another and lead him up to the light, let them only catch the, catch the offender, and they would put him to death. So I thought that was extremely interesting. Men would say of him that he went up and down and came without his eyes. Um, so in a literal sense, he has to do a reacclimation period to the darkness as well, just as his eyes adjusted to the light, his eyes now have to readjust to the darkness. Um, and people might make the, the argument as well, if that world was so good out there, why didn't you stay there, right? So there's gonna be a lot of psychological arguments why these prisoners would project insecurities, project their fear onto this um, hero as an intermediary agent between them and their fears or between them and their other potential realities that they refuse. So they're stuck on step two, which is the call to adventure. They have the possibility to exit the cave, but, the cave, but they refuse. So they're stuck on number three, uh, the, the refusal of the call, right? So the hero absolutely can refuse return because he might uh, face condemnation from his villagers, from his tribe. Um, he's not going to he might have a strong emotional response uh, to looking at that past former place of dwelling. He might have a emotional connection with the other members or family members or whatever people of his tribe constituents. And he might not want to deal with that because of these particular reasons. They might just try to project their fears on him, condemn him, criticize him, etc. So that's definitely a possibility as well. So assuming he surmounts this, assuming he places significance of his moral obligation over his fear for criticism, he returns. 
and this was uh, following Plato's argument. He says, I mean, if they remain in the upper world, um, this must not be allowed. They must be made to descend again amongst the prisoners in the den and partake of their labors and honors, whether they are worth having or not. Um, and then somebody, and then he, he counters his point with, but is that unjust? Ought we, give, ought we to give them a worse life when they might have it better? And that's when he goes into the argument where I was just talking about with like the state and the constituents, we move at the um, rate of our lowest common denominator, et cetera. So that's what Plato goes on. So step 10 would be the return uh, to, to home, return to stasis, you could say. Um, step 11 in the hero's journey would be the elixir, I would say, or you can say the, the uh, reward that you might get in, in a practical sense. In a lot of stories, it could be like the gold from a dragon, like something of value. So, sometimes it could be tangible. Sometimes it doesn't have to be tangible. It could be an insight. It could be a, a strength. It could be inspiration. It could be leading by example, et cetera. But in this case, I just like the word elixir. So we're going to use that. Um, so elixir, we have... Um, Plato saying, wherefore each of you, when his turn comes, must go down into down to the general underground abode and get into the habit of seeing in the dark. When you have acquired the habit, you will see 10,000 times better than the inhabitants of the den. And you will know what the several images are and what they represent because you have seen the beautiful and just and good in their truth. So again, going back to the, the initial statement we had, we shared a second ago, uh, the good is something that was experienced uh, last. It was observed last. So this is something that the, the hero, you can say they would be a master of both worlds, right? They have a more comprehensive view of reality. They can make a strong psychological argument on why these prisoners should leave. They, he can explain to them, hey, I understand exactly where you guys are coming from. Remember, I grew up here. I was alongside you for X amount of years. I, in, I innately implicitly understand this world very intimately. I, I, and I know exactly what this is. And he can, he can um, contrast this with, I've also seen a different potential world. I've seen a different way of living. I saw a new reality. And I'm here to tell you that here's the benefits. Here's the pros and cons. Here's what we can weigh against both, both, um, both realities. And I'm here to try to, I guess you could say, persuade that this former or this latter world is better than the former because I have a more comprehensive um, perspective on it. And it's, it's, a, it's different than like the prisoners can say, I don't want to do that because I'm scared of what might happen, but that's only in the conceptual realm. They haven't actually done something. So in short, a way to say this is it's better to um, it's, it's, it's a stronger emotional response to lose something that you had than to, not attain something that might have been, if that makes sense. So if the prisoner, or if the hero rather, is talking with the prisoners after his return, the only argument the prisoners would have would be purely a conceptual one. They only have one half of the perspective, whereas the hero would have a more pragmatic, grounded in experience, empiricist, um, practical argument of, I've been here, I've been here, here's the experience, here's a reality. I've experienced the realities of both worlds. Whereas the uh, members of, or the prisoners of the cave, they only experience reality of one world and they would only be projecting psychologically fears on the other world and they haven't actually experienced it. So I would say that's hollow. It's not as substantiated and fortified um, and ossified as the hero's perspective would be. So that's why we're looking at this as an elixir because he has something of value. He has the comprehensive perspective of two potential realities. Um, so the final, um, step in Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. We have the ascent, or you can look at this as rebirth or enlightenment or evolution. I would just say ascent. And Plato kind of concludes this um, with the following. He says, the process is not a turning over of an oyster shell, but the turning round of a soul passing from a day, which is a little better than night to the true day of being. That is the ascent from below which we affirm to be true philosophy. And I thought this was actually interesting to parallel to something similar that he said in the Trial and Death of Socrates. I'm forgetting which, which dialogue, it might be um, Phaedo, uh, but he's talking about how his definition of philosophy is essentially the practice of death. And what he posits it as, um, this is a whole long rant in itself, but he talks about the immortality of the soul, the nature of the soul and spirit and that entire realm. But essentially he believes, he subscribes to the idea that the soul is, omnipresent, it's, it's omnipotent, it's all-knowing, and it essentially descends into a human vessel, you could say. And during the course of that descent, of that materialization of spirit, you could say, it loses all of its knowledge, right? So 
that's why that's the meaning behind Socrates or, or Plato's quote, all knowledge is remembering, right? It's a process of remembering. And essentially you can look at it as the, as the analogy of like chipping away at your humanness, you can say. So there's like, when you're descended into a human form, you're born with these blockages, with these conditionings, uh, you're born essentially into this cave. And that's actually what this whole conversation was to begin with, with uh, Plato and the other members in this dialogue, where after he posits this first uh, introductory paragraph, he's, he's, it's in dialogue format, of course, it's how Plato writes. So he's, whoever he's talking to says, you've shown me quite a strange image and these are strange prisoners. And then he says, just like ourselves. So this isn't like a, a journey of a lifetime. You can look at the, this, this entire allegory of the cave. Also the, the um, hero's journey as something that might happen. This can literally happen in one conversation. This can happen in the course of one day. This can happen in the course of a month long relationship with, with somebody, right? So you have these opportunities, you're going through these 12 steps. You can go these, through these 12 steps in one hour with, with, with coming across new information, right? So just like the prisoners, they came across a potential new world. You can entertain a new idea from a book or from a conversation with somebody and you can refuse the call. You can refuse the call to adventure. You can go on the adventure and you, can, you might have similar experiences to this, this hero in the hero's journey of Plato's um, Republic. So wrapping up, I think practically speaking, obviously we can see a lot of metaphors here. Um, I think I want to focus on the number one, I would say, trait or, or characteristic that is imperative for this entire journey to take place. And I would place emphasis particularly on step three, which was refusal of the call. So as a polarization exercise, I think this would require and demand a lot of courage for, on our part. Um, I think this is the, the cornerstone virtue that is being expressed by the hero at every successive iteration of this journey. And that is courage. Obviously, there's other things, um, the open-mindedness, there's just persistence, there's, there's, um, there's a lot of other traits, but I think courage would be the cornerstone one, particularly because I've, I've seen a lot of people, including myself, in some explorations, in some journeys, get caught at step one and two. So we're obviously, we're always at step one, right? Um, ubiquitously. Um, we're always in stasis, you can say, at, in, with, with our intellectual knowledge, with our physical environment, you can say. And we're also, you could argue, always experiencing calls to adventures. We're always experiencing opportunities. We're always experiencing invitations from other people, invitations from the, to, to change the way that we live. We're experiencing uh, thought concepts or, in, or inspiration or encouragement from other people to improve our lives. You can call that a call to adventure, but I think a lot of people, and I've noticed, noticed this in myself, that's why I'm saying it, it's not projecting, a lot of people will refuse that call out of fear. So if you, if you polarize fear, obviously it's gonna be courage. So I think courage is the main cornerstone virtue we should all focus on uh, cultivating in our lives so we can really finalize this entire journey to get to the evolution, to get to the ascent. Um, and some cornerstone principles, actually uh, Srikanth's talking about what well, principles we live by tomorrow. Um, this can be a perfect example for me to, I don't know, implement some of mine. Um, in, in short, I like, to, I like to think of things in very short phrases. Um, I like to really try to, uh, value adventure over security. So if you had the if you had the choice, uh, and I know not everything's black and white, not everything in reality is polarized. But if we had the choice to live, you know, lesser years of adventure or more years safe and secure in the corner, I would choose lesser years of adventure. Again, I know that they're not mutually exclusive. You can combine them to, of course. But um, another way to say this is, um, I would rather be. This is actually in Peterson's Twelve Rules. I would rather be strong than safe. Right. I think that's a very um, I don't know, like very potent way to phrase that. I'd rather be strong and safe. Uh, again, like I said, not mutually exclusive. They don't have to be polarized. I'm not saying you have to live dangerously. You're not saying you have to live unsafe, but um, I do think it's a really accurate way to kind of condense a principle into a word. If you have the possibility, you should expose yourself to these fears, expose yourself to these potentially contravening and detrimental agents that might be attenuating. But when you do that, just as this hero does in the world, he exposes himself to this new world voluntarily. That's the most important part, voluntarily he realizes he has more competence, he has more strength, he has more ability than he has been previously conditioned to believe. And then he can use that memory of that experience to push forward onto every single other journey in the world. Because remember this, like I said, it can be applied at the microcosm and macrocosm, the hero's journey, as well as Plato's allegory of the cape. So with that said, I'm going to pass it to Srikant to moderate questions. Excellent. So folks, what we're going to do is we're going to do questions. Um, as usual, we've got four rules. Type exclamation mark uh, in the chat or raise your hand in Zoom in order to ask questions. Number two, keep on topic. Number three, be brief. Number four, 
speak your mind, disagree with anything on any with anybody, and do so courteously. All right. Um, so go ahead and type exclamation marks in order to um, ask questions. The next thing is that immediately after this, we are going to go into breakout rooms. We're going to have some questions for the breakout rooms. We're going to discuss that for about twenty minutes, and then we're going to come back and put our best question on the table and our best observations on the table. So that's that's the plan. Uh, who would like to go first? Um, if there is no question, I, I'll. I have always questions for John, so I, I give priority to your questions. So, um, so my question is, uh, can you just run through the hero's journey? It was a great presentation. It was a parallel presentation between hero's journey and Plato's cave. Can you just give a very short summary of hero's journey, the sequence? Sure. Um, so I, I, I established 12 principles. Um, I think it'd be even shorter than that. I've seen it done in like four or probably five or six. Um, but essentially, you need a hero, obviously. The hero has to have a problem, number two. He needs some external guide or assisting agent, number three, to help him with the problem because if, if it, he wouldn't be able to do it himself. Uh, number four, he faces that, he surmounts that. Number five, he extracts something from that. He extracts some value, some gold, some insight, something like that. Uh, number six, he returns and he returns to his state of stasis. Uh, and number seven, he leads a higher version of a more evolved self. So I think that's a better consolidation, seven principles. Excellent. Uh, next up is going to be Aaron followed by Ryan. Uh, folks, keep your questions short so we can get through as many as possible. Aaron? Hey, John, good to see you. Um... So I'd be a little remiss to say that in the original allegory, the, the, the guy who escapes from the cave returns and he tries to convince the, uh, the, the prisoners otherwise, and he's like not successful in that. So like, I'm wondering if you are one of these people that is exposing your eyes to the light, do you just move off forward and, and go about your business? Or do you have any kind of social responsibility to go back to your brethren who are still ignorant in the cave and try and convince them otherwise to come join you in the wonderful sunlight that is? Great question. Um, that's that's actually a question that I had. I actually established that as one of the breakout rooms. Um, at what point, like what should the hero do if the, if the prisoners refuse help, right? Should you stay there forever? No, absolutely not. I think you should have um, like judgment. You should make a judgment call. Go, okay, is this a waste of my time? Um, but I do think initially you do have a moral and ethical responsibility to at least return. Um, maybe it's not, even, it doesn't have to be all your time. You could say like, you can bifurcate your time, 60, 40, 70, 30, whatever you want to do, or even if it's just living by example, um, and making your example known to those prisoners. You don't have to necessarily spend your, you know, next 10 years of your life with them. Of course not, uh, because that could be a law of diminishing returns at that point. So it is a it is a judgment call, um, but there's a lot of context and nuances. But but to, to summarize that, initially I do would say um, I would subscribe to Plato's like ethical imposition of you have a obligation to at least like give them a seed of something so they can they can achieve what you achieve. Next up is going to be Ryan, uh, Stephen, and Nir. Ryan, go ahead. Certainly. So great presentation. Thank you, John. Um, I'm, I agree with your comments on the refusal to, of the call, uh, but I always get stuck on the refusal uh, to return. And just curious to hear your thoughts about the psychological implications of perceiving uh, the return as a opportunity to forfeit the elixir or return to stasis. Uh, John, go ahead and unmute yourself. I had to uh, mute you because there was yeah, a- Yeah, totally fine, totally fine. Um, thank you for that question, very interesting. Um, I would say, I actually, we, we, were, we were discussing uh, last week the hierarchy of learning uh, a few weeks ago. And in particular, one of the best ways to consolidate some of knowledge into our memory to be able to recall it was teaching others. Um, in particular, this, this specific hierarchy, this specific diagram had, we retain 90% what we teach others. So even on a practical level, let's say you experience this transformation, you surmounted this obstacle, you, you slayed the dragon, you experience this, this significant transformation psychologically. Um, I think it's mutually beneficial. It's not only beneficial for the constituents or the recipients of your knowledge, it's also beneficial for you because you have to 
focus on what you've extracted. You have to truncate everything that's irrelevant. You have to dispense with all of that noise and you really focus on what you've extracted that is valuable. And I think you do that in the process of sharing it with others through conversation, through, um, you know, promulgating your ideas and your thoughts through reality, through, through, through conversation, through having people challenge um, something that you've established. I think that's, that's very important, at least uh, on a practical psychological level. Um, so I think that can be a, a argument for surmounting that desire to refuse the call, right? So um, yeah, it's, like I said, it's mutually beneficial. I think it could be a good thing to keep in mind. Next up, uh, Stephen, followed by Nir. Stephen, go ahead. Hey, John, I really appreciate your presentation. I use the allegorical cave all the time. And from what you've told me, I've, mis I've been misrepresenting certain aspects of it. I have a way so simplified. Here's my question. Isn't the, the guy who goes out and sees the light and comes back, isn't there a name for that dude? Like a, a, the prince or enlightened something, isn't there a name for that guy? Um, I, mix, I, I could be mixing I parables. I could be mixing parables. <laughs> Go ahead. Not that I saw, no. Okay, cool. Okay. Next up is Nir, followed by Kevin. Nir? Yeah, I thought that the, the people that are still in the cave also have an effect on the one that is coming back from the journey. And there's a risk that they will pull him back down to the original oh, yeah. status. So he has an interest to try to pull them out of the cave as well. Otherwise, they will pull him back. There's kind of a center of gravity. And in society, a lot of people are in a lot of stages of this journey and they affect each other. So everybody has a, should have an interest to pull everybody else as high as possible. It's just a comment. I don't know if it's really a question. Yeah, no, that's actually really insightful. I didn't think about it that way. You said, I guess the force, like the, the, the propulsive force, you can look at it in terms of physics, right? Newton's third law. The propulsive force of the hero pulling has to be stronger than the, than the prisoners pulling him down, right? right? And that's one versus many too. So it has to be, he has to be psychologically sound and competent enough to argue to a multiplicity of different perspectives. Um, so I think that's, and that's kind of tying into my last answer. You have to for really like, when you're expressing something verbally or when you're coming against opposition, it's gonna force you to refine your argument, you could say, or really isolate your principles, you could say. Um, that's a really good way of looking at it, but you're absolutely right. It, I, it's definitely dangerous. It's definitely, uh, he's going to face criticism, but I think that's just inevitable. It's part of everybody's journey in life. Uh, no matter what you do, uh, this is from Emerson, no matter what course of life you decide upon, there will always be someone to tell you that you are wrong, regardless. So. Next up is uh, Kevin, and we have time for maybe a couple more questions. So uh, go ahead if you would like to ask questions. So it's going to be Kevin followed by Judith. Kevin. Hey, thank you. Uh, my question starts, let's see, here back uh, to the cave, try to rescue a half prisoners. If I'm prisoner over there, I need to trust this guy or not. I'm not sure he is a Hitler or other form of uh, help. A second is, let's see, I mean, if uh, let's say I trust him, I need to uh, find a way to learn what's outside the world. You know, how, what, why it's better than what, what do we have? That's my question or statement. Right, right. So that's actually something that I have a phrase written down here in terms of step three to really push uh, to really encourage us to overcome this boundary of a refusal of the call. Uh, and for me, again, going back to one of my principles that I was bringing up earlier, I really, really try to value constructive truth over emotional comfort. Okay. I understand emotional comfort is always going to be an obstacle. It's always going to be there because of biology, because of my brain of conditioning as thousands and thousands of years old that focuses on security and survival rather than growth. I understand sometimes for intellectual expansion, you're going to have to rewrite your conditioning, which is millions of years old, which is extremely difficult. You're going to come across cognitive dissonance. You're going to experience distrust of people that are trying to help you, or you're going to experience projection of your uh, values or trying to justify your current state of stasis, you can say, on the other person. But I think if we hold um, as the predicate to the entire call, a value of, like I said, valuing constructive truth over emotional comfort, I think that can be a great help in terms of trusting the other person from the other side, getting us to realize, okay, this, this is a potential reality. 
and it's not only potential reality, it's potentially better than my current reality. So. Uh, excellent. Uh, thank you. I, I just want to uh, make, make a comment. Um, I think the emotion of admiration is a very large issue here because it's not like when person is at a lower level and a person is at a higher level, one of the biggest things that a person at a higher level can offer is just what they have achieved. So the people who are at a lower level can look up and say, hey, that's possible. And there needs to be mm -hmm. some element of that. So it, it's not just kind of just pulling up. It is kind of, it's both push and pull at the same time, I think. What do you think? Yeah. It has there to kind of motivation from both sides. Absolutely. Um, Nietzsche actually opens his section nine in Beyond Good and Evil on what is noble with that. And he calls it a pathos of distance. That's how he phrases exactly what you're talking about. Um, that distance between men, but he also posits it as it should be within your own soul yourself. So you should always like continually um, surpass yourself, he would say. Um, that pathos of distance is necessary. Um, and, he, and he argues that um, all, all growth of man, all enhancements of man were made at the, what he said is the discipline of great suffering, you can say. Um, and to realize that state of that pathos of distance, to realize, okay, I'm here, I could be here, or this person's here, that pathos, it's going to breed, you could say frenzy, it's going to breed chaos. Uh, it could even breed resentment if you don't take action on it. So that's actually part of Nietzsche's philosophy. Once you realize that pathos, it's necessary but you should, and you actually must, he would make an argument, you must take action to close that gap sequentially, or you're going to become envious, bitter, and resentful, and eventually nihilistic. So, yeah. Excellent. Next up is Judith, followed by Daniel. Judith, go ahead. Yeah, well, if I understood you correctly, I think that's kind of what I was just going to say, like the... Um, the return is seems like almost a requirement for the final ascent. You get, you can't, you haven't seen everything if you have not returned and made, taken that step back um, before you um, move forward. It's like a part of the final ascent, I, I feel. Mm -hmm. You won't have completed um, everything you need to know and learn if you haven't gone back to bring others from the darkness. I agree. I absolutely agree with that. And there's, there's another element there as well. It's like for the hero to return there, he has to be adamantly sure that he doesn't want to be there. Right. Because he, he might have a feeling of bleak, hollow admiration for for you could say nostalgia or nostalgia for what the reality that he used to exist in. Right. So now that he's ascended, now that he's experienced his new world, um, he should go to really define and like maybe clear up any hazy memories he might have of the particular environment or reality he used to live in um, and say, okay, I really don't want to do this. That's just an just a effective and practical exercise for us to do um, is define what we don't want and also define what we want, right? So both, both can be just as, as constructive. So this hero can say, I want to live life as close to tr truth and beauty as possible. Okay, cool, then go live in that world. But also, if he doesn't know what he doesn't want, he doesn't really have his boundaries established. He doesn't have his non-negotiables established, as we talked about last week. He doesn't have these, these um, undesirables to find for him. And him visiting that place, he can say, okay, this is a terrible place. I want nothing to do with this. Therefore, it can be another polarization exercise of if I don't like this, what would I like, right? Excellent. Um, so we're going to take two last questions, and then we're going to go to the breakout rooms, uh, followed by takeaways. So it's going to be uh, Daniel, followed by David Johnson. Daniel, go ahead. Uh, Daniel, uh, you need to unmute yourself. Uh, if not, I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, which step? Uh, which the... step? Go ahead. Uh, sorry, I, I, I always forget that part. Uh, which step in the hero's journey would you say is the most crucial one to pass? Very good question. So looking at the, uh, the, the diagram here, personally, I'm gonna say the uh, accepting the call. So I'm gonna say step three. So refusal of the call, I think that's the biggest barrier because that's what, if you look at it practically speaking, you know, obviously I brought up physics earlier, an object at rest tends to remain at rest. I think it takes the most energy to get us out of inertia. You can argue like 80% of, of energy to just break us out of that inertia. Think of like the analogy with a train, right? It takes like whatever percent of us energy to really get moving. And then it's just momentum from there. Um, I think it's similar with our psychological habits and our beliefs as well. So not to mention that 
as soon as you get over that call, as soon as you accept that call, you meet a mentor, you meet a guide. So that's momentum. That's that's exogenous forces assisting you in this journey. And then crossing a threshold, again, that's all momentum from there. Once you cross that threshold, you can't go back. That's not an option. So you better go forward. You know, yes, it's uncertain. Yes, it's uncomfortable, but you better go forward. And I think it's, it's the same sequentially with all of these other aspects uh, with the exception of refusal of return. We do have momentum from the previous uh, iteration and, and IOTA pushing us forward, propelling us forward. Um, I think so. So yeah, in short, I would say refusal of the call and the second refusal of the return. That's, that can be um, also dangerous, but I think more dangerous is refusal of the call because we're just going to sit in, in stasis all day. And as we know, the, the law of universe is change. Nothing is staying the same. Everything is getting better or worse at every second. So next up is David Johnson. All right, let's have some fun with some critique here of Campbell. He as an analyst, uh, he has uh, analyzed myths and he's developed some tropes, but to a certain extent, is he imposing his findings on uh, uh, worldly or world myth mythology? Does his tropes become conventions and become cliches? I would be interested in a story without a guide. I would be interested in an anti-hero's journey. And to what extent are we imposing Campbell upon Plato in this discussion uh, tonight? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so very good question. So I would say the first one, that could be a, a, a solid um, hypothesis. Like he might be imposing his beliefs, his, his definition of um, these are the patterns that I have found based on my understanding of mythology, right? He could just read that and then establish that. Um, I do think that could definitely be a possibility. Um, I've read snippets of Hero's Journey. Uh, it's been a very, very long time since I've read Hero with a Thousand Faces. So I honestly have to reanalyze the entire book, um, like, like not the entire book, but in depth, essentially, to really, really answer that question. Or maybe just go to the source myself and read the mythology myself and then see if I come up with something different, right? That's just as effective and transferable to other myths, you know what I mean? Um, so maybe, I would say the first one, it's, it's, but it's a fair assumption that we, we are imposing or he's imposing. Um, the second idea doesn't become cliche. I think absolutely. Um, I do think I, I kind of agree with you. I love, particularly, I have this weird little like um, niche taste in like movies, for example. I don't really like like big box office movies. I appreciate movies that kind of like they're a little bit more underground. They kind of stray from the dominant narrative of like we just established hero, guide, villain, etc. Um, they can kind of be a, a little scattered, but it kind of forces you to use your imagination a lot better. So I think it's more active consumption than passive consumption. I think if, if we are to this uh, mythology, to maybe um, the, the hero's journey to a T, it might be a little bit more passive, might be more easily digestible. I mean, obviously Disney movies are for, for children, they're for people of all ages. So it's like people can get interpretations from that. But if something is a lot more active, it demands concentration, demands attention, demands creativity. Um, it can also be just as interesting. So um, does it be completely say, absolutely, I agree with you, but I, I am agreeing with you as well, where like there can be other potential storylines and narratives that can be just as efficacious, just as practical and valuable without this, this particular framework. Um, and third, are we imposing Campbell over Plato? Absolutely, that's, that, that was, that's what I did. Um, I think, you know, with, with all that, with all the, the first two answers uh, already established, I think it was, like I said, Nonetheless, it's still, even if it's cliche, even if it's overused, I still do see these two things as useful. The reason I, I did this presentation today, uh, coalescing these two, uh, was so I can really just put them in context and remember them more. Because um, like I said in the beginning, as we, I think if we tether things to our already established base of knowledge, or we, or we look at them in their applications, or using them as examples, we tend to remember them more. And these are two concepts that I've really always wanted to have in my accessible memory, which is Plato's allegory and, and, and Campbell's uh, rough estimate of this, this journey, if that makes sense. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, John. Um, now, next up, we're going to do breakout rooms. So okay. what are the questions for the breakout rooms? What do you want people to okay. do? So we have three questions that are going to, uh, the, the discussion in the breakout rooms is going to uh, center around. The first question, um, why do the prisoners have a hostile reaction on the hero's return? Why would they have a, why would they be hostile to the hero if he's trying to help them? 
Second question, um, what should the hero do? This is kind of uh, Aaron's question. What should the hero do if the prisoners reject help? What should he do? How sh should, he, should he leave? Should he stay longer? What should he do in your eyes? Um, third question, what do you think a harder transition would be for the hero? From darkness into light, his eyes fixating on that, or from light back into darkness, back into the cave? What is a harder transition out of those two? Wonderful, folks. Um, all right, so I'm going to start the breakout rooms now. The breakout rooms will last for exactly 20 minutes, and then we'll be back here to share our takeaways and put one question, the best question that you can think of on the table. All right, starting the breakout rooms now. Welcome back, folks. Welcome back. Um, all right, so it's time for takeaways. Let's try to keep the takeaways short because we want to get, uh, is there a, is there a lag between what I'm saying and what you're seeing me? Or are you seeing yes, a lag? Yes, your voice a little bit lag. Okay. Um, let me see what I can do about it. I don't think I can do much about it. So uh, at this point, because it will be mostly other people talking. So let's let's do with that. Deal with that that way. Um, I'm going to try to shut my video and on and off and see if that helps. Okay. So folks, we're going to do takeaways. I'm going to call on people in the order in which I see them on Zoom. Try to keep, keep it to maybe about five sentences. You can say, what are you walking away with? And most importantly, what's your question? If you have any question that you, would, that you're, you still have, which, which is the most productive, um, that, that would be most, the most interesting thing. So I'm going to call on people. Uh, let's start with that. Um, it's going to be Jackie, David Roller, and Jean. Jackie. Thank you both. Lovely evening. And I did mention in the chat earlier, um, the movie Finding Joe. I recommend people take a look at that. It's Joseph Campbell. Fantastic. I recommend it. John, you um, kind of quickly said something about, well, you know, the timing doesn't really matter. Like you can go through this in an hour or, you know, whatever. I don't know. I'm just kind of curious if you explore or thought about, is that really true? You know, because I kind of equate, you know. The, okay, so your question is yes, about timing? Okay, thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, next up is David Roller, uh, Gene, and Ryan. David, so go my ahead. Question, I guess my takeaway is the, the concept of the guide. Can the guide, is the guide can, does it have to be something physical or can it be, you know, metaphorical, where you basically are creating your own guide. Um, and the take or the question I have is relates to when the hero returns and his return is kind of, I guess you could say, rejected by the prisoners. How persistent should the hero be to, to before the hero, I guess you could say, gives up in trying to convince the prisoners to follow him. So that would be my question. Excellent. Excellent questions. Uh, next up is Jean, Ryan, and Mark. Jean? Yeah. Um, our discussion is quite interesting. I think uh, we, the third question actually we were discussing, I was thinking uh, from dark to light, I think it's easier psychologically because you have hope you um because somebody said it's harder but to me it seems easier because even though you never see the light but you have this vision and you have hope and it's always progressing and so when you already in the light you go back to darkness that's pretty depressing i cannot imagine how that will ha happen you know it must be a very bad experience and also i think you cannot teach people who don't want to be teached, you know, like, like a person uh, going top of the mountain and describe all the great views and people below the mountain, they can never comprehend it. And the more you try to teach them, the more they will resist. That's why I like Indian yogi's approach. Indian yogi never try to teach anybody. They only teach people who keep begging them to, be, to teach them. I think that's Thank maybe you. a better approach. Excellent. 
thanks, Jean. Um, so if anybody wants to skip their takeaways and questions, they can just type skip and you can skip that way. Uh, next up is Ryan, Mark and Towa. Yeah, thanks. I'm really appreciative for my group. I'll keep it brief. We got into an interesting conversation about the relationship between the returning hero and those that are still in the cave. And the question that I'm grappling with are what are the factors that will cause the returning hero to be perceived of or become a tyrant? Excellent. Okay, got it. It's tyrant. Thanks. Um, next up is Mark. Tova and Stefan. Mark? Okay, a lot of stuff here, but I'll limit it to one thing. Um, the discussion about going from dark to light or from light to darkness. Um, one thing I wanted to see your opinions on is, doesn't it depend on whether it's a matter of choice or not? If you're returning to the darkness to aid others and you know you can always get back to the light, that's a very different situation to where life's circumstances are forcing you back into the darkness against your will. Excellent, excellent. Uh, next up is Towa, Towa, Stefan, and Deborah with the H. Towa, Towa. Um, I, I loved today's discussion. I guess my only question is just what creates the desire to for for the philosopher to return? Okay, why go back? Okay. All right, excellent. Um, and what we are going to do is that it looks like. There's a lot of questions about going back. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm categorizing all the questions. Next up is uh, Stefan, Deborah, and Aaron. Uh, Stefan, I can't hear you. I think there is something wrong with your mic. I'll go to Deborah, and if you can try to fix that, uh, you can ch check the audio settings. Maybe they they're turn too low. Uh, next up is Deborah, Aaron, and Maritza. Deborah. Okay, so my question was um, also having to do with returning. Um, what's the hero's motivation? Is it to mitigate loneliness so that others can relate to that person after they're enlightened? Because if that's the case, my thought was that it might not be sufficiently motivating to the other people who are still there in the darkness. Excellent. Motivations of both hero and the prisoners. Excellent. Um, next up is Aaron, Maritza, and Nir. Stefan, whenever your uh, audio starts working, just type exclamation mark and I'll come to you. Aaron, go ahead. Uh, so there were two major questions that came up in my breakout room. One is what is the initial catalyst or what is the initial thing that gets the first person out of that cave? Um, and then the second question is when we think of the person that leaves the cave and they see wisdom and knowledge, what exactly is that wisdom and knowledge precisely? Is it like the, the, to, to, to rule in an enlightened way, to be benevolent to people, to self better yourself? Like what exactly are we focusing on? Okay, so what is up? Okay, um, excellent. Uh, next up is Marisa, Nir and Steven. Marisa? Hi, so you know, looking at this um, hero's journey, the, the writing on it, to me, it, it makes come to mind, um, I don't know if it did for anyone else, but it comes to mind Nietzsche to me. Um, and I think of the Ubermensch and, and um, you know, in, uh, in his book, Thus Spoke, um, Zarathustra, he says, um, he makes a quote, I don't remember a direct quote, but it's about uh, Phoenix. And he talks about, you know, in order to, to, embrace change you have to first like you know burn yourself because if you don't how can you come up through ashes and i'm sure i'm butchering that quote and i apologize to any big nietzsche fans who can quote it verbatim I, apologies i should have looked it up but i see in this the ultimate of the hero's journey and my question would be what what i don't see is there is a an admonition of lingering too long after having returned to the to the cave when you're trying to help others find the enlightenment, where in the hero's journey um, rules does it address the concern of when when do you realize that it's too dangerous for you to continue to linger and it's time for you to move on? Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. So we got all these amazing questions about the the cave when the 
and the hero returns. All, all kinds of questions about motivation, um, about the hero being a tyrant, it being too dangerous for the hero, uh, the motivation from the prisoners. It's, it's just amazing, amazing level of questions. Uh, next up is uh, Stefan is ready. So Stefan, Nir, and Steven. Uh, yeah, so mine's also about returning. So. I'm thinking that sometimes you might go on this evolutionary stage, but then you, you know, you, you might reconvene with your old life, old people, and they just don't click with you anymore. And, and I feel like there could be this crox, this crossroads where there's a temptation to either suppress a part of yourself to maintain that, that stasis, mm -hmm. or to just release it and go on to something even newer and i don't know what the question is i guess it's just like it can be a tricky conundrum yes wonderful uh so the group the old group dynamics and how, how that works okay excellent next up is near steven and jyoti near so first of all this is my first time with this group and I really appreciate it. It's really great. Thank you so much for doing it. Uh, it was very interesting for me to see that different people think about the journey in different ways. For some people, it's a, like a career or a financial success. And for other people, it's a psychological or spiritual journey. So that's why people see it differently. And it's just interesting. Thank you, Nir. Uh, next up is uh, Stephen. Uh, Hiro and Ron. Stephen? Uh, you're on mute, Stephen. Thanks. I remembered the name. It's the Philosopher King. It's in the Republic. And I remembered it before uh, Aaron mentioned that in our small group. So I was real excited about that. Um, the other point is, why does the, uh, why does the person come back in the cave? In Buddhism, there's a principle called the Bodhisattva. And the bodhisattva realizes that there's only one consciousness. And for the bodhisattva to be conscious and not have everybody be conscious is of no avail. And my question, if there's a question, is I really question this guy's authority to go back and just install another belief system on, on the crowd and just go from one shadow system to another shadow. So what gives that guy the authority to do that? And complete. Okay. Excellent. Um, authority. Okay. Next up is Hiro. Oh, sorry, I misskipped Jyoti. So Jyoti, Hiro, and Ron. Uh, for me, this was a, a very enlightening lecture because sometimes in my life, I saw myself as a prisoner. Sometimes I saw myself as a hero. And I think nobody paid attention to the hero's journey of tug of war. Uh, that was that he was going through with the prisoners and he was trying to bring them up but they were looking at him very skeptically they were threatened by him so the hero's journey actually i can see that as a very exhausting and a very lonely journey and what would keep the hero going it depends on totally depends upon his spiritual development psychological makeup and his whole outlook towards life. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jyoti. Uh, great observations. Uh, what keeps the hero going? Um, next up is Hiro, Ron, and Laura. Hiro? And, <clears throat> and what is it internally that uh, produced whatever it was in the hero that inspired him to to even want to get out, like uh, was it something in his DNA, or was it something that comes along from a uh, previous life? Like in his previous life, he might have been a bodhisattva that that promised that he would continue on in this journey as a philosopher, and and so he's in this situation again, and somehow without uh, everybody else being uh, not wanting to to even think of escaping, it, he manages 
to uh, to uh, little by little get out. And and I was in the group with Laura, and and she talked about uh, this kid that that got in prison and he spent five years uh, just reading instead of uh, messing around with his other uh, cellmates. Mm -hmm. And and so he, he got out and went into studying and to become a lawyer. And that was pretty inspiring. So I was wondering, what is it internally that, that brings that about? Wonderful. So it's, it's um, you know, the idea of catalyst. You know, what is the initial catalyst? Um, excellent. Um, next up is Ron, uh, Laura, and Peggy. Ron? Now, so my question is, uh, over the millennia, uh, over the entire face of the planet, thousands and thousands of men and women have escaped the cave seen the spiritual light, seen the truth about the self, have come back to tell humanity about it. And my question is, why, why or oh why does humanity keep ignoring them? Okay, excellent. So what's the psychology of the prisoners in the cave? Um, excellent. Next up is um, Laura, Peggy, and Peggy. Jean. Okay, I think I sort of said to the group that I, the only, I, as I listened to everything, I put it in today's terms and looking at it at a pragmatic level, I wanna translate all of this and see how it applies to today's society and how we can use it given that we have sort of a ground zero approach right now to how we have to rebuild our society, how we can apply this to that, to that project that we have ahead of us because we do have some heroes and we do have the cave, so to speak. And I see that is really in that part of the marginalized population, which includes prisoners as well. So it's, it's sort of a broader thing. Anyway, that, that's, uh, so I would like to say, how can we apply this to um, our current state of affairs? Excellent, excellent. excellent. Next up is uh, Peggy uh, Judith. And Joe, Peggy. Yes, the, um, mine's kind of a question, and uh, it's from a different angle. Um, it has to do with the prisoners, and um, does I know philosophy is understanding, and I, I and compassion. Um, does the hero have um, if he can't change their minds? because they have a different background, education, upbringing. Um, does he have compassion for them? Mm -hmm. Okay, very, very good question, uh, compassion. You know, how does, how does the hero, what does the hero feel about the prisoners and what is his motivation in regards to them? Next up is Judith, Joe, and Kevin. Judith? Yeah, so my question is, um, I feel like um, all of us probably can identify times in our lives when we were maybe like, felt like we were heroes, we saw a kind of a light, we wanted, we wished that other people could see that, but, but um, it's a human journey after all, so I imagine that there are new caves and new darkness, so my question is, what can we do in, as the prisoners that we are in, the, even if we've seen a light, you know, I mean, um, just the fact that we don't even address the fact that we may be a prisoner in the darkness, how can we look for a guide or a light or, or identify the shadows in our lives so that we can get out of our prisons that we are in? <laughs> okay, excellent, excellent question. So what, what should prisoners do uh, in order to kind of to escape uh, the prison? Next up is Joe, Kevin, and Dave. Joe? Um, most of what I've, uh, uh, what I was going to say was actually a, has already been covered, but um, uh, the, I'm going to build on what Stephen and uh, Aaron had asked, and the idea that the heroes leaving and attaining a, a certain knowledge about the world and then returning, what's to ensure that knowledge is then wisdom? And I think that that's an important question to understand because then that'll be the difference in being able to communicate to the people in the cave and not so there's a lot of virtues that go within that so that's my question pretty much um 
and there are a lot of uh, uh, things along the lines of um, that we can talk about. One thing that I just a really quick takeaway that I thought that was very important is also the the journey between uh, darkness to light and light to darkness. Um, initially, I thought the challenges in going from darkness to light would actually be much harder and going from light to darkness would be much easier. Mm -hmm. But uh, Jody had actually raised a very good point in the idea of how loneliness in that process is also a challenge and on the way down is not necessarily easier. So it's there is a lot of virtue that's in both of these processes that, that, that the hero undergoes. So those are the two main things. But most of what I've said, the other things I was going to say have been covered. Excellent. So virtues kind of going up, virtues going down. So I think, so I'll put it as virtues uh, of in both directions. Next up is Kevin, Dave. Uh, so Kevin Callahan, Dave, and then Kevin Zhu. Kevin Callahan, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Um, well, we discussed the darkness to light and light to darkness question um i we didn't necessarily have an agreement but i thought that the darkness to light would be more physically painful and it would be a paradigm shift we're going from the knowledge of the sun which represents the good back to the darkness doesn't involve a shift of your worldview over your understanding because you've already lived your whole life in the cave so you're familiar with it we talked about a lot of other things too excellent Excellent. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the challenges you know, going up and going down uh, and the difference that it, going down is easier. Uh, next up is Dave, uh, Kevin, and Manoj. Dave, go ahead. Thanks, Shikhan. Excellent discussion tonight. And, and I was in the small group with Kevin Callahan, and we had an excellent small group discussion. And we, we moved away from the literal story and got into allegory and metaphor. And, you know, or, you know, are we all prisoners in our lives? You know, uh, what does the light represent? Uh, excellent discussion tonight. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Dave. Uh, next up is Kevin, Manoj, and Roxanne. Kevin? Yeah. Um, my question from either perspective is uh, uh, acceptance of here. What's the here <clears throat> definition? Why from president? Why he's here? And if let's say hero can do, I cannot do it. Then also a hero is for outside world and not for me, you know, inside a prison. So, and finally for prison, prison I would say prisoner is, it has to be actively mm -hmm. accept. It's not passively, this hero won't help me accept. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So what's, what, what, sets, what sets hero apart and yeah the motivation of, of the prisoners. Next up is Manoj, Roxanne, and uh, we'll find out the next one. So Manoj, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Srikant. Uh, I came in a little late, but I didn't hear the role of a threshold guardian, guardian and the mentor in the hero's journey, allegory to the Plato's cave. But when you look upon it as a spiritual journey, uh, the there is no going from light to darkness with when you when you see it as wisdom when you have the wisdom it is uh, irreversible that's one point and uh, i just want to contrast the bodhisattva approach with the hindu approach of advaita non-dual philosophy which says when you become enlightened uh, the whole world becomes enlightened because Everyone is you. So the philosophy in a nutshell is the only real thing is you. Everything else is fake news. There is no cave, no other people. There's nobody to get enlightened. That's a cold and bitter truth. Thank you, Manoj. Uh, next up is uh, Roxanne, uh, Jonathan, and Paul S. Roxanne. Hi. Um, I don't really have a question. I'm just agree with the last person that once you see something you can't unsee it once something is enlightened it can't be veiled again 
And once your eyes are open, they stay open for that particular thing. That's what I've found personally. So thank you for this, it's been great. Thank you. Thank you, Roxanne. So great points from Manoj and Roxanne. So we'll see you know, what's, what's the nature of Hero once he's grasped the light. Uh, next up is Paul S. Anaki and uh, Andrew Cohen. Paul, go ahead. Okay. Um, for me, I don't know even why we are discussing this. Like it was uh, compared to what we had a few days ago where we talk about Jordan Peterson, Maps of Meaning or Ayn Rand. This is this, the e easiest. The, why are we talking so much about something which, which, which is so simple? I, Shrikam, this time I don't understand what, what is the point uh, making from the easiest uh, republic which we all know, which we all read for sure. a long time so ago. I'll, I'll, I'll phrase the question as why is this relevant? We know what, what is the use of this? Okay, so we'll, we'll put that as a question. Next up is going to be, uh, let me see, Andrew Cohen, Marco, and uh, Cotton. Andrew Cohen, go ahead. Andrew, are you there? Okay, next up is Marco, Cotton, and uh, Michael. Um, yeah, I was just thinking from the, like the perspective of a person who has like a negative mindset, I mm -hmm. guess it's easier for someone to, if they're in the light that it's, it's easier to go back to the negative mindset, okay. the darkness. Excellent, so it's easier to go back, okay. Um, next up is Cotton, Michael, and Joe. Hi, um, I came in a little bit late, but I, what stood out for me was when John said, and I don't remember the context, um, choose the adventure versus the emotional comfort. And uh, if you had a choice between living a shorter life with a more concentrated adventure versus longer life with more that really resonated with me because that also kind of ties into what Ron, somebody asked, like, you know, he said, why isn't anyone listening to the philosopher? Why, why, why? And I think it's because that's exactly the reason um, because, you know, you're given this roadmap in life. It's a journey. So you're, you have N number of years. So many people, I think, uh, just kind of follow the natural um, progression of like, human or physics, earthly physics, where you go a little bit, a little bit chaos, and then you come to some sort of a state, like a steady state. And then they're just happy there. Whereas the true hero, they have a little broader vision. They don't think it's the end result. You know, it's kind of analogous to everyone is going on some sort of a lengthy hike. And then a, along the way, it's hard getting grueling. So a bunch of people just uh, settle down and build a civilization and they're like, oh, okay, that's that. Whereas the hero takes a little rest and then he has to keep going whether he feels good or not. And that's one thing I keep forgetting is when it gets really hard in the moment, just like, okay, just you have to keep going. So that is a very powerful message I got today. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Cotton. And by the way, the, um, you know, John uh, in talking about adventure versus security was answering the question that we are talking about tomorrow at 1230. Oh. The question is what principles do you live by? So that's, that's what we're going to discuss. I, you know, I invite all of you to come and talk about the principles that you live by. Uh, next up is Michael, Joe, and Donna. Michael? Yeah. Um, so thank you for this evening. Um, so it's both of my comment and my question have to do with uh, the journey uh, with the hero returning to the cave. So the comment um, from the prisoner's perspective, and I think we can all relate to this, is when you feel you're right um, to kind of dethrone yourself, so to speak, this throne of your own psychological kingdom. Um, you know, when you think of it that way, I mean, <laughs> you may not want to forfeit your throne for however many seconds, minutes or whatever. It, it feels very threatening. Um, and then from the perspective of the hero, 
Um, I think they they probably have to embrace and cultivate virtues in their self-realization process. I see that as a given. And if that were to be the case, um, I think it would be easy for the hero to have this kind of dilemma as to whether they put enough effort into convincing the people or bringing the light in a successful way. And, you know, it would be a shame if they had some apathy, um, the shift to apathy after like, yeah, I tried. Mm -hmm. So just a, a thought there that, you know, if they were to shift to apathy, um, you know, that may not feel that great. So they may feel like they're, they haven't successfully done the process of uh, the hero's journey. Thank you. Uh, next up is Joe, the other Joe, uh, Don, Donna and Kimberly. Joe, go ahead. Are you there? Okay. Next up is Donna. Yep. So my question is, I'm interested in the dynamic of in-group and out-group influences, especially in the journey of leaving and returning to the cave. Okay. Very good. The group dynamics. Okay. Excellent. Uh, next up, is going to be, um, it's going to be, uh, I'm going to give it to Mike, uh, Joa, and Julie. Mike, the gentleman for magic, I yield you one and a half minutes. One and a half. I th this time I don't need too much time because everything that could be said has already been said, uh, but I would uh, offer a different perspective. When Socrates talked to Glaucon, imagine uh, a cave and uh, and so forth. He was really discussing from uh, another example of how he was trying to convince Glaucon that what we see as reality is not reality. And uh, the hero's journey is something that was added by uh, Joseph Campbell and by the Matrix people. And he was just talking about the fact that made, that reality is uh, what, what you see depends on your point of view and all your preconceived notions and uh, not so much as a real uh, prisoner uh, that is get, getting all these uh, things. Got so it. it's, it's, re it's a, a, a reality. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike. Next up is uh, Joa and Julie. Don't know if I'm pronouncing the name correctly, but uh, next up is Julie. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, first of all, they say like, if you don't have any more lessons to learn, we would just die. So um, I don't know that someone's totally in the light and then they go back to the darkness. I think if they did, they probably would not, they would probably see what they could learn instead of trying to teach anything. And they, because they and they would do so with respect and humility and all the things that they come learn from the light um uh, more often i think we're all the hero and the the prisoner and for myself i've seen the light many times and i've stayed in that stasis word that he used at the beginning um stuck not that i didn't see the light but because i was too afraid to take a step towards the light mm -hmm. and that could be uh so taking a step towards the light means for taking risks and it takes courage. So my my comment is that I think that, that we live in the cave, we're all gonna have to go back to the cave when we get off the call. Mm -hmm. And for me, the challenge is, will the darkness take over me again or will I continue to stand in the strength of the light? And this kind of call is what I consider um, a guide because the word, there's no uh, coincidence that the word courage and encouragement are in the same word and from encouragement of like-minded light people i feel the courage to go into the darkness and stand unthreatened by it and uh yeah thank you thank you julie really appreciate it now um what i want to do now is i want to kind of bring together all these all these points i'm going to try um so first let's talk about the mentality we're just going to go through different stages I'll make some comments and I'm going to open it up for comments. Try to keep your comments extremely brief. 
like a couple of sentences, okay? We're just going to go through this entire life cycle of the hero, okay? I'm gonna make some comments and then you're welcome to speak, but speak only like a couple of sentences at most, two or three sentences or whatever your core observation is. So first question, um, you know, so we're looking at this entire cycle. So it starts with the sta stasis, okay? It's the or ordinary world, the something that you are familiar with. Um, okay, let, let, me, let me actually step back. I am not that familiar with Plato. I'm not a big fan of Plato. So I'm going to use different systems to, uh, and I'm always, I mean, the, one of the things that we do in these meetups is called syntopical thinking. I'm going to bring up other thinkers who have talked about it. So one person who has talked about it is Carl Jung. So from Carl Jung, it is kind of going from the unconscious to uh, more of the conscious and making the unconscious more conscious in order to fully develop yourself. And that applies to an individual, that applies to, to society. Um, then you can look at um, you know, Daniel Kahneman's idea of system one and system two. A person who is doing only what is in the ordinary world in the status, in the stasis is just using his system one, whatever is familiar, and he just stuck there. Whereas somebody who actually tries to go forward requires that effort, especially, you know, kind of choosing to, you know, heed the call of saying, I will take the risk, I will take the adventure. It, it is an act of will, it is an act of taking, um, so that's kind of going away and then kind of coming back. So I'm going to kind of keep using different systems to talk about the, the hero's journey. Okay, so first question is, there is the ordinary world. Why do people leave that ordinary world? Why, what is it? What are the, what are the, um, what are the initial catalyst? What is the, what is the motivation? Why do it? Uh, any, any, any answers? You can go ahead and just type an exclamation mark and I'll come to you. Give your answer in as short a term. In principle, why do heroes leave the city? Uh, Jordan Peterson talks about heroes. Uh, so let's, let, let, let me put, let me put, uh, bring Jordan Peterson in. Um, I think he's Jordan. I like Jordan Peterson better than Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell, I think, is, I think Jordan Peterson understands the negative of, of the human psyche much deeper, and he's he faces it much more than Joseph Campbell does. I think, based on what I know. So I'm going to come back. The essential story is that everybody is living in this walled city. Hero is the person who leaves the city, goes out into the wilderness slays the dragon at tremendous cost to him, gets the gold and brings it back to the city. That's the, that's the core of our story as per Jordan Peterson. So first question and just very brief answers from everybody. Why does Hero leave the wall city? So it's gonna be Mark, Joe and Hiro first. Mark, why? One word, suffering, the Buddhist answer. It's looking for something because of suffering and a desire to look for something better, a lessening of the suffering. Joe, why does hero leave? That's pretty good. Um, I think it's a sense of duty, you know, and, and that um, they believe it's something bigger than themselves. And Hiro, so why I, does, sorry, sorry. I, I'm, I'm just going to keep it brief so that we can get as many voices on each of the steps. Okay. We're going to go through all the steps. Uh, next up, uh, Hiro, why does Hiro leave? It's a combination of seeing the suffering of others and what could happen to yourself, and also maybe seeing uh, something inspirational, probably a guide that says, Got you can go this other way. Um, Judith says it's not fulfilling. Um, next up is Jean. Why does Hiro leave? I think... Hero leaves to, uh, to search for truth. Excellent. Uh, Laura, why does Hero leave? Uh, you are on mute. Uh, next up is Aaron. Aaron, what about you? What do you think? Something tragic happens tragic to them. Happens to them. Okay. Uh, Laura, uh, what's, your Laura what's your answer? Want of riches. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, let me, let me okay. Uh, next up is Jyoti. 
Jyoti, why does Hero leave? Personal growth. Excellent. Uh, next up is Manoj. Crisis, build sandcastles and the ocean washes it. Learn helplessness. Keep getting whacked by life. Next up is Debra. Um, just being unable to abide by like oppression or an oppressive system. Okay, uh, next up is Jackie. Jackie, why does Hero leave? Pursuit of God or perfection. Thank you. Uh, next up is Cotton. Um, I think it's a whisper from the soul, like inception, something. Excellent. Uh, next up is Joao. I don't know how to pronounce your name. Go ahead. You got it. Boredom. Boredom. Okay. Next up is uh, Stefan. Why does Hero leave? Uh, because all life wants to evolve. Excellent. Uh, Stephen. Just, I, I'm with Catton. Inner tension. Okay. Next up is uh, Kevin. A hero want to experience something different. Okay. Uh, next up is uh, David S. The hero senses that there is some other possibility, uh, which would be beauty. Excellent. Uh, Julie says, uh, life begins at the end of your comfort zone. There is gain in stretching. Uh, Donna says, hero is propelled to, propelled to leave because of fear or love. Okay, so that is, that is the impetus for the hero to leave. He goes, uh, now in terms of the challenges, most of the questions were not about the challenges. Most of the questions were on why he leaves, few questions, maybe 10% of the questions. Then there are a lot of questions about why does he come back? Okay, so let's ask that question. Okay, so we, we're going to ask questions about why he comes back. And then we are going to talk about the dynamics of what happens to the hero and the prisoners when the hero returns. So first, just why does the hero come back? Why does the hero come back? Um, let's see, who is next? Uh, Dave. My comment is why the hero leaves because several good men ventured in the forest and they never returned. Okay, uh, let me see here. I've lost track here. Okay, so Jyoti, why does Hero come back? Sense of responsibility. He wants to uh, give what he has gotten. Hiro, why does Hero come back? Because the Davis told him to. Well, according to uh, Buddhist scripture. Okay, next up is uh, Michael. Why does Hero come back? I think it's subconscious. It's a desire for shared reality. You want to have a mirror for what you've uh, developed. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up is Joe. Why does he come back? I, I agree. He's excited to to teach what he's learned and to help raise everyone's. Uh, you know. Excellent. Uh, next up is Kevin. What do you think? Uh, the cave is uh, the previous home of a hero. Okay. Uh, next up is Cotton. Um, to, to, he, he leaves, um, it's a reception. And then um, to come back is expression. He has to express it, like language learning. Got it. Next up is Mark. Mark, why does he come back? Um, ethical responsibility, and we are social creatures. Excellent. Uh, next up is Jackie. Why does he come back? <clears throat> Um, temptation, human, uh, he has to, it's human duality. He has to come back because of okay. duality. Um, Laura, why does he come back? <clears throat> okay, next up is Marco. What do you think? Uh, empathy. Okay, uh, next up is Julie. Why does he come back? Does he, come back? he doesn't come he back. Doesn't come back. Uh, uh, he never sees it. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, Laura, you, you have a lot of echo going on. So just say your piece and I'll mute you. Go ahead. Laura, okay. why does he come back? I think he wants to come mm -hmm. back to um, in, in have him share with his these people um, 
what can, what life can be about and help generate an enthusiasm in them for it and then show have him explain how they can do it too got um, it got it next up is julie julie sorry to interrupt you go ahead okay he, he doesn't really come back to teach or do anything he's already there and he no longer is in darkness and in okay. being that he changes people he doesn't have to prove it he is it and they see got that it. light okay got it uh, next up is manoj why does he come back there is there is no back he doesn't need to prove anything to anybody he doesn't need to speak slowly and profoundly like the pseudo gurus out there okay uh let's see uh next up is joe joe why does he come back uh to give back uh what they received and to uh take on a new challenge excellent so last two is jean and roxanne jean why does he come back yeah, I think it's to share his knowledge and joy. Excellent. Uh, next up is Roxanne. Why does he come back? Yes, I, I just typed that to share his knowledge of Excellent. the light and the joy that he feels. Excellent. So, so it looks like the answer to why does he come back is almost universally accepted. That's fairly simple. Um, so I, that, that's, that's very interesting. You know, what, what is difficult and what is simple? Uh, the, the first one was a little bit more, there was more kind of range of views. Um, here, there is no range of views. This is basically, you know, everybody's saying essentially the same thing in various, various words. Okay, so now let's go to the hardest part. Okay, so now he's back. He's back in his city, in the cave. I don't understand caves very well, so I'll, I'll talk to the city. Um, so you come back to the city, you have something, okay? Now the people of the city don't quite get it. They are not quite there. Uh, there is a distance between what you are and what they are. You understand them. They don't understand you. They can kind of, some of them who want to go up, again, using Jordan Peterson's term, who want to go up can see that you are kind of upward so they are, there is the admiration wanting to stretch. There are people who are actually envious when they see it, but most people actually don't see it at all. So you have this entire range of things. Okay, so, so let, let's see, what, what, are the, what are the great questions here? Okay, so I'm gonna to try to formulate questions as crisply as we could do for the first two, which is a little bit challenging, okay? so. Um, so we can talk about the prisoners, what is happening to the, not let's call it the people of the city um, who are kind of set in their ways and are very comfortably going about doing whatever it is that they're doing. Um, we can talk about the hero and we already know his motivation that we are agreed on. Um, okay, so let's start with, the state, start with the prisoners. Let's start with the people of the city. Okay, um, no, because we, we have to start with, keep, keep with the hero story, okay? Let's keep with the hero story. Um, so what is the most difficult challenge? Now that he's back, he wants to give something to these people. What are his greatest challenges and what are the limits that he has? So, um, Let's, let's talk about challenges and limits at this point. Let, let's see if that produces uh, anything. So what do you think is the most challenging thing for the hero and what are the limits of what he can do? Uh, this is a more complicated question. So I'll give you three sentences, okay? Instead of one sentence, you can talk for three sentences and let's see where we can go. Uh, so it's gonna be Aaron, Jairo, Jyoti next. Aaron, go ahead. In convincing others, is that what the question says? Yeah, no, no. What? Uh, so he has come back in order to give whatever he has found to to his people. Uh, they are, they are, you know, they are where he grew up. He's trying to. He found something valuable. He wants to share it with these people. Mm -hmm. What are the challenges he faces? Gotcha. What are the limits? Got it. Or let, let's call it just challenges. What are the challenges that the hero faces? Let, let's start with that. And then okay. we can we can expand for what are the challenges he faces? He can't you can't teach someone 
your personal experiences that you've seen. It's Beautiful. hard to do that. Beautiful. Um, Aaron, uh, Aaron is done. And next up is Hiro. Hiro, what are his challenges? Mm, I, imagine, his I imagine that 99% of the people are happy the way they are and they don't realize they're suffering. And also there may be uh, pseudo, uh, pseudo and enlightened or pseudo gurus or, or, or pseudo philosophers that, that are trying to do the same but are not Got it. right there. Maybe Got it. they're, next, they're next doing up. it wrong. Excellent. Next up is Jyoti. What are his challenges? How to win the trust amongst prisoners. Excellent. Uh, next up is Kevin. What are his challenges? Hey, thank you. First, uh, I like your metaphor. It's the cave is like city. Uh, the challenge is uh, find a common value with prisoner. The limit is everyone is unique. You cannot do everything for as use the same rules to satisfy. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, next up is uh, Cotton. What are his challenges? Um, he cannot control control the degree of open open or closed mindedness of the people, and um, his limitation is he can just throw out the information, whatever you want to call it but he doesn't have control of the outcome. Excellent. Uh, next up is Debra. What are his challenges? Uh, I think relating to the people without being condescending and then reconciling the importance of social interaction with personal enlightenment, basically deciding which is more important. Okay. Uh, next up is Laura. Laura, go ahead and quickly. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, I'm, go with, ahead. I'm with Debra finding a point in which he can begin to discuss things with people, not to feel that he's condescending toward them. Um, so find a, um, that mechanism and use it all the way through um, both ways. Uh, thank you, Laura. Uh, next up is uh, Mark. Um, lack of understanding and trust from others and also how best to use his newfound knowledge to, for the benefit of others. Excellent. Um, next up is uh, Zhao. Zhao? Uh, Zhao, in, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Uh, okay, next up is Dave. Uh, trust so he will be accepted. Okay, next up is Julie. Julie, what are his challenges? Nope. Okay, next up is Joe. Joe, what are his challenges? Um, remaining honest in a situation where people's realities are now going to be upended. And so being a uh, stalwart. And, Excellent. And uh, thank you. Uh, next up is Zhao. Zhao, go ahead. How do you pronounce your name, by the way? Uh, you said it correctly, Zhao. Zhao. OK, go ahead. What are um, it's just him trying to prove uh, that there's value from what he's teaching. That's basically it, I think. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, so those are his challenges. Um, now let me see, what, what is needed from the prisoners? What, are, what is needed from the people of the city for them to actually benefit from this? Because here is a benefactor, okay? He has found something. He actually, in an open-hearted way, wants to give it to people but he has all these challenges. So what is it that is needed from the people of the city to whatever extent, whatever his, their limits are, what is needed from them for Hero to be successful? Because it looks like there are many, most of the challenges seem to be kind of limitations of the people you know, of the city or of the cave. So what is it that is needed? I mean, given that Hero is here uh, up there and these people are you know, below, um, what is it that they need to have in order to at least gain something from the Hero? So uh, let's see. Um, so it's going to be Michael. Michael, go ahead. What is needed um, from the prisoners? Sure. Um... Humility that creates psychological space. Excellent. Uh, let's see, I've lost everything here. Uh, who is next? 
Okay. Uh, next up is uh, Jean. Jean, what does it take from the from the city folk? Yeah, they need to be open and uh, eager to learn and progress. Yeah, I, I, yeah, it's op openness, humility, excellent. Uh, Aaron, what does it take? What do, what is needed from them? Really, they just need to want it. People just need to want things at this point. Very nice, very nice. Uh, next up is Marco. What is needed from them? Um, for them to like embrace chaos. Very Be nice. Open. Uh, next up is Deborah. What is needed from them? Um, yeah, I mean, the same kind of thing about an open-mindedness and a willingness to be open-minded, but I feel like accepting someone who is different and changed. Excellent. Uh, Joe, what is needed from them? Um, they need to be self-aware um, so that they can understand that, you know, what is being told to them and being open. Um, and I also look at it as more it's on the heroes. Uh, it's more the hero's responsibility to give to them mm -hmm. than it is for them to accept it. Next up is Cotton. Um, just, uh, just the chance to let this person talk and he might hit one person who might convince somebody else, but just a chance. Excellent. Uh, Kevin, what is needed from, from them? Uh, it's a mutual understanding and sharing. Okay. Next up is Hiro. What is needed from them? Uh, I think a little bit of, of what got the hero going, uh, a little bit of seeing the possibility that there is suffering and then seeing the possibility that there's a way out of suffering and then sitting down and listening. Okay. Uh, Joao, what is needed from them? Uh, just an open mind, perceptiveness. Very nice. Uh, next up is Peggy. What is needed from them? Oh, a passion to grow out. Oh a passion to grow. Okay. Uh, next up is Jyoti. Jyoti? Uh, make them familiar with their situation. Okay. Very nice. Uh, next up is uh, Kevin Callahan. Suspension of disbelief. Okay. Very nice. Uh, Towa. I guess to teach or like to learn the sensitivity to recognize uh, the change themselves before consciousness. Okay, very nice. Um, Judith, what is needed from them? I, I don't know. I mean, it just seems a little arrogant. It's kind of bothering me. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the same thing's needed on both sides. And I don't think that, that there's a hero that we have to look for that has our answers for us and vice versa, that we are heroes for other people. Maybe we just listen and have humility and try to see things from another perspective and then everybody grows. I don't know. Okay. Uh, humility, you're saying. Um, next up is Mark. Um, Open-mindedness and a courage to embrace change. Excellent. So, um, I mean, it looks like what is needed from them is, it seems to me exactly the same thing that Hero had when he left. The kind of openness, you know, willing to, to kind of face chaos, willing to kind of take little risk or something like that. Is that true or is it, is it something like what is needed from them? Is it the same thing that is needed from the hero or is it something completely different? Is it the same or different or similar or different? Any thoughts? Maritza. I think um, it's exactly the same. It, um, I'm gonna, sorry, I, I like Nietzsche, so I'm gonna compare again to Nietzsche. You know, the will to power. Mm -hmm. It's necessary when for the single and it's also necessary for the prisoners because without that will, why would you try to do any kind of transformation? Okay, so Marisa is saying it's the same. Uh, let's see who else. Uh, okay, uh, Mark, is it, this, is it the same thing or similar thing or is it something different? I would say it's similar. I'd say one thing that maybe differentiates is um, in this situation, you need a willingness to accept help. Right. But um, I mean, I just want to point out in the in the hero journey, we kind of skipped a few steps. One of the steps was the guide. So ah. in this sense, you know, this, you know, the, we are also saying that, the, you know, the, so hero is being a guide in some way. Okay, I, I, I agree with you. I withdraw my comment. 
Okay, no, that, that's a good, good, good comment. Um, next up is uh, Jean. Is it similar or is it different? I think it's similar, but not the same extent. When to be hero, you need more courage to facing the chaos. Then at the city people, they just accepting it much easier than the first one. Excellent. So I mean, the point you're making is that it is similar, but the degree of courage is different. That's excellent point. Uh, next up is uh, Joe. Um, I think it's uh, similar, but uh, you know, their, their knowledge can be limited to what the hero knows. I mean, it's because he's the guide. If they were just to do it, you know, explore their own way then that like the hero then that would be more infinite okay um, um yeah. next up is uh julie what the prisoners need is it similar or different well i would say it's trust and belief in another possibility okay next up is deborah um, I think they're linked, but I think for the prisoners, it's more of a personal or interpersonal understanding. And for the hero, it's like a wider understanding. So it's still understanding, but in a different way. Okay, so let me let me uh, formulate the question um, crisper, I think. I need to formulate the question crisper. So what is it that is common? Um, what is it that is common that the city folks need to have common with the uh, hero and what is it that does not have to be common? So what what is what is the same and what is not the same? What is similar and what is not the similar? Um, so Kevin, similar situation but different uh, approach. It's times different, uh, the uh, personal ability uh, and willingness different. Okay, um, Dave, what is the same and what is different? Uh, different is the hero had a reason. Uh, the townspeople need motivation. Excellent. Um, next up is uh, Aaron. Aaron, what is same and what is different? Uh, I mentioned that the, the hero has tragedy. And it, it's kind of like that for the townsfolk, but I would use the word for them desperation. They have to feel okay. desperate to listen at this point. Excellent. Uh, Mike, what is the same and what is different? Uh, hi. It uh, depends on what the uh, dip distance is between uh, what the uh, uh, what the traveler sees as compared to what the prisoners see. Okay. Uh, uh, next up is David. David S. What is similar and what is different? Right. Um, someone said, um, well, that this well, there's sort of an advantage to the hero and that the hero was isolated and the disadvantage to the people who are not going to have to make that excruciating journey is that they're going to hear each other's noises and reinforce the common view, which is something the hero didn't necessarily have to deal with that pressure. Excellent. Uh, next up is uh, Jyoti. Jyoti, what is same, what is different? Uh, Jyoti, you are on mute. I can't hear you. I think curiosity was a um, hero's uh, virtue, and that made him leave. And contentment was the virtue also with the prisoners. They didn't want to leave, and they were very con you know, content in uh, their, their safety zone. So they were, dissimil they were not similar in their thoughts. OK. Um, Joe. Um, actually, Jody just actually took exactly what I was going to say. There has to be a level of curiosity that's the same um, and and courage as well. Um, as far as different uh, and David, actually, there's the difference of the hero is isolated, whereas the other is more in a, more in a communal situation. So therefore, it becomes actually much more of a challenge to accept something now. OK, now let's go to, um, you know, uh, one one of the points I want to make very quickly is what uh, Jordan Peterson talks about is the power of a kind of thinking in terms of a person. Like in many cases, like hero does not have things worked out mm -hmm. and he kind of has to struggle alone with it out there in the wilderness, figure it out. But then when these when he comes back, the other people have the hero in the sense that it's like a prototype. It's like, a, you know, so I think that, 
actually makes it a lot easier because it's like having a guide. It is like having a model. Um, and I think that is a sense in which, you know, it is easier. You still need to do it. It still needs effort. But I think, I think that's one, of, this is one of the core ideas of Jordan Peterson uh, that he keeps coming back to. Can having actual, you know, thinking in terms of a person, oh, that can be done because I can see it, it being done. Um, uh, so let me see. So f firstly, this is, this is really, this is really amazing. You know, how much gr ground we've been able to cover um, very quickly over, um, over, over a short period of time. So um, are there any, it's like, uh, so th this is, so I'm, I'm very, very happy with this one. Okay. I don't think we have answered all the questions, but I think we did a good pass over many of them. I think at least like 70% of them maybe. Um, so there are certain, you know, few questions that remain, which we'll have, you know, other meetups to work out. And uh, folks, so uh, this is delightful. So I want to tell you about a couple of things that are coming up. Tomorrow I'm doing a meetup at 12.30 on what principles do you live by? Okay, and I have a Reddit now. We are, we are using a Reddit so people can actually, you can go ahead and answer that question on Reddit. Um, I'm going to put the link in. Um, so that's, I, I would re definitely recommend that because I want to get that Reddit going, that's going to make a very big difference um, because it will provide a continuity of uh, communication. This is something that Gene has been wanting for some time. Uh, so uh, Gene, I listen to you sometimes. Uh, so here, here is the Reddit. Uh, so please uh, join and please comment and be active uh, because I want to build that up. It will also bring in a lots of lots of really interesting people uh, into the meetup. So I really look forward to that. Um, so that's one I'm launching on Reddit. The second one I've launched on Reddit is going to be the next uh, Friday. So next Friday, we're going to be taking a review of this self-improvement meetups. And the question on the table is, what are the most useful ideas you've learned from this self-improvement Fridays? So it's a way of doing, you know, giving thanks, if you will, and uh, sharing what, what we have learned. So I look forward to seeing you for both those meetups. Uh, it's been a delight and an honor, folks. See you soon. Bye.